started this process a little over six years ago, um, interestingly, uh, looked at this notion of sustainability in, in real estate. And as the green building movement and the various green rating systems were starting to take hold, we noticed that there was a considerable gap in thought. Uh, the, the question was, okay, well, that makes perfect sense, um, but what about all the people inside uh, these buildings? Uh, is there yet a body of work that addresses human or biological sustainability in the built environment? Uh, we're all spending 90% of our time indoors. Uh, our homes, our offices, uh, this room right now where you're sitting is having a direct and an immediate impact on your cardiovascular health, your respiratory health, your immune health, the lighting that you're taking in right now through your circadian optic nerve is gonna influence the way you sleep tonight. So there was a, an interesting uh, notion here to start to uncover what can be done uh, to influence health uh, and wellness outcomes in the built environment. So very early on, uh, we got a group of doctors and architects into the same room. Didn't tell them why they were there, just kind of sat them down, three doctors, three architects and at the time asked uh, what was a pretty provocative question, uh, which was the following. Um, I said, guys, if you had to dream it up, what types of things could we do to introduce preventative medical intentions into the way we design and operate buildings? So when you consider that over 90% of the cost of any building are the people inside of it, salaries, wages, benefits, productivity, output, attraction, retention, uh, that represents an interesting economic proposition for well building. You know, based on numbers like this, if you can get a 1% gain in productivity from the people inside the building, that literally will cover the entire uh, energy cost of, of a building. So well is for people. Um, much like, again, green building has been really a building uh, specific type of program, this really starts to focus on operational, and architectural protocols uh, that can passively, again, deliver uh, these preventative medical intentions through the various categories of the standard, which we'll get into. So, you know, for instance, you can have um, the best air quality in the world in a building, but if you got poor lighting or, 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 or unfiltered water, you don't have a, a healthy asset. Uh, so there are preconditions that have to be met across every single category, and then the standards ha has what we call these optimization features to to achieve higher and higher levels. This is not about water uh, uh, usage, the amount of water that's used or saved. This is about water consumption. So it's about the quality of water and the location and the placement and the access to hydrating stations. It's important to drink uh, throughout the day, but far too often we're burying our water uh, fountains or, 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 or faucets, what have you, in a pantry in the corner that no one's ever seeing simple guidelines with regards to within X amount, X linear meters of, of a workstation to have visible hydrating stations. This is, this is nothing. This is not even big science here. This is just common sense. But if you could regulate that and put that into design, you're going to have people hydrating more often, which has a huge medical outcome. In the United States, I'm not sure about here, but in the United States, if you look at the average size of a dish, of an American dish since 1950 till today, it's doubled. And that's encouraging people to consume more at a time. So simple operational regulations and guidelines that look at the centimeters, if you will, or the size of dishes that are served in school cafeterias or, or corporate cafeterias, again, could have a huge impact on, on how, we, um, how we ultimately uh, nourish our bodies. For tens of thousands of years, we would walk this earth outside. And we would wake up with the sun and it would cross the sky and, and, and then ultimately set. And during that day, we would be active and productive and mentally acute. And then as the sun would start to set and we'd get to ultimate darkness, that's when the body would be at rest. That is our biology. That's our natural 24 hour clock. Then we started building these boxes around ourselves and spending most of our time inside in a room like this, where we're not getting the exposure that we used to to that bright sky during the day, for instance. So only 12 years ago, medical science discovered something in our eye called the circadian optic nerve. And it was the first time that doctors realized that there's something, there's a mechanism in our eye that has nothing to do with vision. 
And that er nerve actually takes in peripheral light, and based on the kind of light or darkness it's taking in, it's pretty much the only thing that is controlling the hormone production in our body for productivity and for sleep. So what we initially determined was that, for instance, if you're getting exposure to higher lux, bluer, whitish light in the evening and late in the evening, it's terrible for you. That's tricking your body into thinking it's still 11 o'clock in the morning. Conversely, yellow, softer hue light is better for digestion and more conducive to healthier sleep preparation and deeper sleep. Now, if you actually install and put in the appropriate amount of circadian appropriate lighting, and even in a dynamic sense, we could actually and literally extend the workday and keep that productivity up for these employees um, for you know, that last several hours of the day during the winter months. Now, here's the best news. Circadian appropriate lighting is a costless decision. You can choose any lux, temperature, hue, lumen of light across that spectrum. So if we're able to intervene in these lighting decisions, we can create circadian appropriate environments and have a huge impact on productivity and sleeping patterns at effectively no cost. Subconsciously is background noise, is noise that we're not really aware of, but it's really uh, harmful for the body. And, and stress is, is obviously the leading cause of most, um, most diseases. So, you know, when you think of paying attention to acoustics and creating quiet zones uh, versus collaborat collaborative zones or, or really putting more focus on uh, acoustical ar architecture, uh, it becomes uh, apparent that that can actually be, again, passively fantastic for, for the human condition. And I just learned this recently. The male condition versus the female condition has about a six degree Fahrenheit difference. And yet building code is set primarily to the male condition. So, you know, we obviously are often hear about um, uh, folks being cold or constantly, um, you know, their fingers being numb. And, and so, again, paying attention to this and really diving into the medical components of what this all means uh, can really change environments for people. <coughs> Sitting is terrible for you. Uh, it's not a natural position for the human body. Sitting is bad for our circulation, sitting is bad for our digestion, sitting is bad for our posture, and yet what, what have we done? And we've traditionally created these desks and these cubicles and told people sit down and have a meeting. Um, you know, a lot of this is, is awareness and posting nutritional facts or what have you, um, getting people to become more accustomed to and understanding what it means to be in a well-certified environment, to in, be in a building that has the spatial co components that are optimizing health and well-being, but also the operational components and the programs and the programmatic elements that are optimizing well-being. Um, for about a decade, the industry has been asking this question, maybe even more, do healthier buildings or wellness programs, do they lead to more productivity? And we think that there's been a jump uh, from point A to point D without really trying to identify uh, the middle. And we'd like to deconstruct this line of logic. We think the question first should be, point A to point B, do healthier building practices mean healthier spaces? Point B to C, do healthier spaces mean healthier people? And point C to D, are healthier people more productive people? That's probably the better and more constructive line of logic to try to determine.